Peripheral venous cannulation is a key procedure that provides direct access to the patient's bloodstream through the insertion of a catheter. For medical students and junior doctors, inserting venous cannulas is a procedure they will commonly be expected to perform. So being able to perform it correctly and with safe aseptic technique is a key skill to master. Additionally, being confident in performing peripheral venous cannulation whilst under pressure is vitally important given its crucial and potentially life-saving role in the resuscitation of critically ill patients. Therefore, it's essential to know the key steps in performing the procedure, be able to identify appropriate sites for cannula insertion, and importantly, be aware of the types of complications that may arise as a result of the procedure itself. But before we carry on, don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you don't miss out on any of our new content releases. Okay, let's make a start. The indications for performing venous cannulation include the administration of intravenous fluids and blood products, the IV administration of particular medications, nutrition, and also chemotherapy. And also, they can be used to allow the injection of intravenous radiological contrast agents for CTs, MRIs, and other forms of nuclear imaging. Whilst there are no specific absolute contraindications to venous cannulation, there are several relative contraindications. These include the patient having a significant burn or infection at the proposed site of cannular insertion, or if the extremity is severely injured. After washing our hands, we start by introducing ourselves, checking the patient's identity, explaining the procedure, and then obtaining their consent. We make sure the patient is in a comfortable position and that their arm is well supported at the height that is easy for us to access. We can now set up our equipment on our clean treatment trolley. The equipment we need for cannulation includes antiseptic skin preparation, non-sterile gloves, a cannula, an adapter for the cannula device, a tourniquet, some sterile gauze, saline solution, a cannula dressing, and a sharps disposal bin. We then put on our non-sterile gloves, and check the patency of the lumens of the cannula adapter. By flushing each of the lumens with saline. Having ensured that there are no contraindications present, we can now look to identify a suitable vein. Unless we are inserting the cannula to resuscitate an unstable patient, or for someone who is at risk of significant bleeding, then we should try to avoid the antecubital fossa. And if possible, aim to insert our cannula in the dorsum of the hand. After placing the tourniquet, we should look for a relatively straight vein that lies superficially, as this makes inserting the cannula much more straightforward. If you are struggling to locate a good vein, then there are several things you can try including gently tapping or rubbing over the vein, asking the patient to lower their arm and using gravity to help engorge the vein, or if you are still struggling, then try the other arm. Having identified a suitable vein, we then clean the area with the antiseptic wipe and leave the antiseptic preparation to air dry. As we wait, we take the cannula device and gently slide the needle partially out of the cannula and then back into its original position. By doing this, it ensures that there are no defects with the device and that the cannula will advance smoothly once the needle is inside the vein. When cannulating the dorsum of the hand, we should get the patient to make a gentle fist, as this helps to make the skin slightly more taut. 
which helps to fix the vein in place. We hold the cannula in our dominant hand, whilst our other hand applies gentle traction to the skin. The cannula needle is inserted with the bevel pointing upwards. It's introduced at an angle about 20 degrees from the skin surface. The needle is slowly passed through the skin until there is a give as the needle tip enters the lumen of the vein. At this point, we slightly lower our hand, so to reduce the angle of the cannula. The needle is then gently progressed a further 2 to 3 millimetres. At this point, the cannula can then be smoothly advanced over the needle by moving the hub of the cannula towards the skin surface. After seeing the flashback, it's important to lower the cannula and reduce the angle of insertion before advancing the needle any further. Otherwise, we risk puncturing the back wall of the vessel, which could lead to the formation of a hematoma and ultimately an unsuccessful cannulation. We can then release the tourniquet and the needle can be removed. If we were using a larger cannula, then pressure over the vein should be applied as the needle is being withdrawn to prevent any spillage of blood. We now attach the adapter onto the hub of the cannula. We can now safely dispose of the needle into the sharps bin and flush the device with sterile saline. As we do this, we should check that the patient does not experience any discomfort and that there is no swelling around the cannula, as this would indicate that the cannula is sitting outside of the lumen of the vein and therefore would need to be removed. If we are happy that the cannula flush is fine, then we can secure it with adhesive strips before applying a transparent dressing. Additionally, we also apply an adhesive label with the date that the device has been inserted written upon it. We can now safely dispose of our equipment, wash our hands and document the cannulation in the patient's notes. It's important to review the patient after the procedure to ensure they remain well and don't have any signs of complications. Further to this, with regards to managing the cannula, we should ensure we use aseptic technique, undertake regular flushing to maintain the patency of the lumen, keep the cannula and the dressing clean and dry, and also ensure that regular reviews of the cannula site are performed so as to identify any potential complications. Typically, it's recommended that most peripheral venous cannulae are kept in situ for up to 72 hours to help reduce the potential for complications. But ensure that you're aware of the specific policy of the hospital in which you're based. Whilst peripheral venous cannulation is a minimally invasive and commonly performed procedure, it is associated with the occurrence of specific complications that it's important to be aware of. These complications can be divided into two groups. Immediate complications, or those associated with the actual insertion process, and late complications, which are those that are associated with the presence of the catheter itself. In terms of immediate complications, we have being unable to successfully cannulate the vein, bleeding or hematoma formation, which are typically associated with the unsuccessful cannulation attempt. We also may cause injury to adjacent structures, such as blood vessels or nerves. In terms of late complications, the patient may experience significant pain from the presence of the catheter itself, especially when placed around joint creases. The presence of the catheter may result in inflammation of the vein, which we refer to as phlebitis. This is relatively common and may occur in as many as 45% of cases of peripheral venous cannulations. The patient may develop thrombosis, or occasionally thrombophlebitis, in which the inflamed vessel results in the simultaneous development of a thrombus. Whilst infection and line sepsis occur more commonly with central venous catheters, it may still occur with peripheral cannulas. 
it's typically associated with non-aseptic technique during insertion, poor post-procedure management of the device, and also keeping the cannula in situ for too prolonged a period. If the catheter becomes displaced, this can lead to extravasation or the administration of fluid and medications outside of the vein, which may lead to pain and swelling, and in severe cases, compartment syndrome and tissue necrosis, particularly when administering chemotherapy. If you found this video helpful, then make sure you subscribe to our channel for more great free content. Or, if you want to make learning for med school and board exams easier, then subscribe to surgicalteaching.com and check out our expert endorsed videos, high yield revision questions, and our supportive online community. Surgical Teaching was designed by doctors to help students learn smarter. And right now, you can enjoy all of our great content for less, with 20% off our annual premium subscriptions when using the code STYouTube20. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you soon.